12,000 years ago, which is not very long at all on a geological time scale. This place that I'm sitting right now was underneath a mile thick sheet of ice. I mean, like that's, that's game over. You can't live there. You go try to find somewhere else to live. I eventually I concluded like, I don't like nuclear energy, but it looks like we're going to need a lot of it. And then I started learning about it and realized a lot of what I knew about nuclear energy just wasn't true. The Atomic Energy Commission had this dual uh, mission to promote the use of nuclear energy for its benefits to society and at the same time regulate it and make sure it was safe. So there was an alternative version, an alternative theory called the threshold theory that says that up to a certain amount your body can handle low-level radiation and then above that it can't. Fukushima didn't kill anybody so that you can see that the fear is not based in a kind of rational worry. It takes still 10 years and a billion dollars just to get a license application approved for a new reactor. This idea that we're going to uh, reduce emissions by reducing our energy use is a really a non-starter with me. The answer in my view is um, don't degrowth, don't deindustrialize, don't depopulate, but just change how you're providing energy and materials with which people make their lives. Joshua, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to talk about a bright future and we have a lot of energy questions to go through today. But first, why don't we start with your background? Can you tell listeners a little bit about yourself and why you decided to write this book about a bright future? Sure. Um, I grew up in, thanks for having me on. It's great to talk with you. I grew up in California in uh, the old days and I was an environmentalist. Um, I didn't like nuclear power at all. Uh, and along with the war in Vietnam and industrialization and all the things that environmentalists didn't like back then. And then over time, I had a couple of children and it changed my perspective as climate change started to come to the fore. My uh, older child became a climate activist when he was 11 years old, now he's 30. So he was always pushing me, you know, what are we gonna do about climate change? And I, most of my work was about war and peace, although somewhat broad ranging. I do sort of global trends, um, trends in war and peace, trends in the, the global economy, stuff like that. And I'm a data person. I really um, resonate with hard evidence and I like numbers. So I, I, got it, I decided to shift my focus about 10 years ago to climate change as my main uh, global trend that I'm looking at. And once I did that, I wanted to look at the data, uh, you know, in terms of what does my son want, the, the climate activist? Not a bunch of steps in the right direction, not a bunch of ideological talking points, but what's really going to work? How could we actually solve this problem? And it turns out it's incredibly hard to do. And it turns out that the scale involved is really hard to get to with a lot of the solutions that seem like they're steps in the right direction. And I could add that I had an electric car starting 15 years ago when it had a range of 19 miles and no backup, you know, <laughs> lead acid batteries in the car. Um, I put solar up on my roof. I've done all the, the green things, but I really like just expecting everybody to do green things and that we're gonna somehow solve climate change. It's not happening, not getting there. Um, and that's when I came across nuclear energy, um, which is of a whole different scale. And uh, so eventually I concluded like, I don't like nuclear energy, but it looks like we're gonna need a lot of it. And then I started learning about it and realized a lot of what I knew about nuclear energy just wasn't true. And that actually, the more I knew about it, the more I did like it. And um, so one of the things I learned was that Sweden had decarbonized their electric grid really quickly um, by building a bunch of nuclear reactors. Um, side note, that was environmentalists that had demanded that because they wanted to stop building hydroelectric dams on the last of the free flowing rivers in Sweden. Um, and there was a guy named Stefan Kvist, a young Swedish nuclear engineer who was writing academic articles about Sweden's experience and how it might be emulated elsewhere in the world. And so I got together with him to write the book, A Bright Future, which is 
sort of Sweden oriented, but also more global about how could we do what Sweden did and use nuclear energy to try to get at this very difficult problem, climate uh -huh. change. Um, and then uh, after it came out, I had an op-ed in the New York Times uh, after that, and it was also reviewed in the New York Times. And those things got the attention of this filmmaker, Oliver Stone, who was very famous in my generation, um, less so for young people now. Um, but he decided to turn it into a documentary. And then we've spent the last three years, almost four now, um, working on that process. Very long Great. involved. That's another whole story, how, to, how an academic tries to interact with Hollywood and turn a book into a film. But we did eventually <laughs> get the film. It's called Nuclear Now. Um, it came out last year. And, um, and very cool. That's that's the story. That's how we got here. <laughs> now, I'd love to hear more about how you changed your mind on nuclear. You said initially you were opposed to nuclear. Then you were recognizing that we probably need it, but you don't want it. And then now you're you're advocating for it. What were the the steps along the way there to changing your mind? Were there any particular catalyst? Yeah. So the first step is just doing the math. Um, how much carbon is going into the into the atmosphere? Um, you know, flattening out is what the Paris uh, Agreement was going to do. Just sort of flatten out our carbon emissions. That's not good enough. That's like continuing to put up the same amount of carbon every year that we do now, piling up in the atmosphere and driving this global warming process. Um, so you realize, kind of add it up and look at everything we're doing all the wind, solar, hydro, batteries, uh, energy efficiency, new technologies, all that stuff. And you realize you're only about halfway there. You know, like you're, you're, you're going to slow down. You might even actually peak the rate at which we're putting carbon in, but it's, we need to bring it to zero pretty fast. You know, a couple, what, 25 years now. Um, and so just these part measures aren't going to work. And you look in your bag of tricks for, well, what else do we have? You know, and there's like nothing in there but nuclear. So that was my first big realization. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember realizing that the climate problem is so serious, but it's so slow moving um, that it's hard to mobilize people and, and hard to get people to change their minds. You know, what I had this phase of like, what would you do to not have to build a nuclear reactor? And people have all kinds of, you know, expensive and convoluted things that they would do instead of nuclear. Um, but more often, they just don't talk about nuclear. It's, it was kind of taboo. So mm -hmm. that was the first realization was that this is important and, and we have to be talking about it. We've got to get the conversation on the, you know, get the subject on the table and start talking about it because just pretending it doesn't exist isn't going to work. Yeah. Um, you I made a great a little... point there about climate change, about how, how it's so slow moving that it's, it's sometimes difficult to mobilize people. And I think another point that was made, I think, in the beginning of the book was that there's, it's, it's, all, it's politicized. And there's, yes. on, the, on the right, it tends to be an, an ignorance of it. And on the left, it tends to be bundled in with dismantling capitalism and all these other things. And yeah. it seems to be limiting the, the effectiveness of any message. If you were to try and make a, a kind of clear and succinct message of what problems are we actually facing today with a change in climate, what, what are some of those things that might resonate with folks? Well, the biggest thing about climate change is that it's so slow to unfold we're like the frog in the pot of boiling water, right? And the things that we do now are gonna have their biggest effect 50 years from now. And so um, I have a granddaughter now who's a year and a half old and you know her whole life is gonna stretch into the next century. She's gonna blow way past 2050 that we're all talking about. And uh, in that second half of this century and early next century, that's when things are really going to get very serious. And one thing that bugs me in the climate discourse these days 
been this way for years, is that there's this emphasis on climate change is here. The problem is right now and we need to solve it right now. And in the next six years, we need to decarbonize or something. And that's completely not going to happen. Totally impractical. Um, and on the other hand, climate change is here because there's more storms, hurricanes, fires, etc., just like was predicted. But that's not the climate change I'm worried about. Like if this is what climate change looks like, a bunch of storms and, and floods and stuff, we could we could handle that. We would do fine. But it's the things that are going to happen 10 years, 20, 50 years from now, if we don't get our arms around this problem and and stop it. Right. So people are still talking about the short term way too much and things we can do right now, effects we're seeing right now, trying to stay under one and a half degrees. Uh, you know, I think it's right there in the book that we're going to blow past one and a half degrees pretty quickly. And it's actually happening faster than I had it in the book. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep us, if not under two degrees, under two and a half. It's like we have serious, serious downside here if we don't solve this problem. And the book, I liken it to a, an asteroid is out there in space and it's going to hit the Earth, but not for 30 years or something. It's like if, if it was going to hit the Earth next year, we'd be mobilizing everything. We'd be pulling in all the all the militaries of the countries in the world, all the budgets. We're shooting off rockets to knock it off track and everything we could do. But when it's not going to hit for 30 years, you're like, ah, you know, but and yet 30 years before it hits is the time when you can actually move it off track. Right. If you try to do it at the last minute, it's not going to work. So it's right. a little like that. And the left and the right bothers me a lot, too. I call it two forms of climate denial. One on the right, the, the people on the left talk about a lot, you know, and it's certainly true The people on the right say climate's not a problem, we don't need to worry about it, CO2 is good for plants or whatever that that whole line is. And just like, oh, this problem doesn't exist, we don't want to think about it. And that's pretty tempting because it's so hard to solve. But then on the left is this attitude that climate change is such an existential desperate problem, and yet we have time to first end capitalism or first achieve these this and that leftist goal, most of which I agree with, by the way. Um, but, you know, that we, we're going to solve those things first, and then we're going to somehow get a climate solution on the back end of that. Those are big, long historical problems that are not going to be solved quickly. And mm -hmm. going with that is the idea that if we just, you know, it's such a desperate, serious problem, but if we just build a lot of wind and solar arrays, We'll we'll solve it, and we're not going to solve it that way. You know, these as much as you know, like I said, I, I like solar up on the roof, but we're, you're not going to solve it that way. So, what's missing is this kind of practical middle ground of this is a really serious problem, and it's not easy to solve, but it does need to be solved. And let's look at the realistic options. You mentioned that, you know, things like the storms and the fires and additional like extreme climate events that that seem to be increasing in, in recent years. You said that these are kind of manageable, that we can kind of work our way through those. But there's risks that we can't, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. What are those specific risks and why can we deal with these extreme climate events, but not the future ones? Well, talk about the turning points in my thinking. One of them was. I live in Massachusetts, and actually, I'm a, a 13th generation Massachusetts resident, so <laughs> we feel pretty tied to the place. And I realized at some point in thinking about climate, you know, how's climate going to affect Massachusetts? How bad could it be? And I'm in Western Mass, so not at the ocean. Sea rise isn't going to get me here. There's pretty much enough water, at least for now don't have a lot of those frontline issues that people deal with in some other places. And then I realized that 12,000 years ago, which is not very long at all on a geological time scale, this place that I'm sitting right now was underneath a mile thick sheet of ice. And you're like, that's, that's game over. You can't live there. You go try to find somewhere else to live. And only the other places are having their things. They're flooded by, you know, uh, high seas and, and, uh, whatever, you know, droughts. And so when when those kick in and there's sort of big changes in the global weather patterns, um, 
That's what I worry the most about, the big disruptive changes. And we don't know, maybe it'll be okay. Uh, maybe there won't be a, a sheet of ice again. Um, probably not actually on that particular scenario, but we, it's a big risk to take, to gamble my granddaughter's f entire future on hoping that the worst scenarios don't develop when I've been watching this issue since the 1990s anyway, and it's a long time. And so far, everything that people have worried about and projected into the future, when the reality hits, it's actually worse than what was projected. Mm. Keep, and I mentioned this, you know, uh, 1.5 degrees, when will we pass 1.5 degrees? And I think it was going to be around the 2030s, 2040, and we're going to blow through it in the 2020s. Everything's, you know, accelerating worse than expected. And at the same time, the uh, efforts to reduce carbon emissions haven't worked. You know, we're not reducing them. Mm -hmm. And we, we'll talk a lot about that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. You know? I think this climate change discussion often, People who are opposed to any sort of climate action, I think they they tend to approach this through the lens of, um, I don't want to decrease my energy output because that may that's kind of like a a a, um, a setup for poverty. Like if I'm if I'm forced to limit my energy usage overall, I'm now less prosperous. I think that's the the line of thinking in in most of the opposition to climate change. Can we unbundle this and kind of split the two ideas apart that carbon emission doesn't always have to be linked to total energy usage and 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 how are are you um sympathetic to the idea that energy and prosperity tend to work together and they tend to kind of um you know, have a have a tight relationship over time. Well, that's it's true. It's a fact that uh, if you want prosperity, you need energy, and this is what the poor countries in the world are uh, facing every day. If they want to climb up out of poverty, they need energy to do it. China did it. They lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's just a miracle uh, for the people there. But they did it with coal. Right, they did it with a huge increase of carbon emissions, um, and so uh, it's it's how you how you do that. But this idea that we're going to uh, reduce emissions by reducing our energy use is a really a non-starter with me. Um, it might be that here in Massachusetts, actually, we have had some success here in Massachusetts, and I personally, in my household, have you know, insulated and turned off lights and done all this stuff. And I've got a pretty good profile relative to my neighbors, I guess. But in Massachusetts, um, we, uh, we can do that with some good effect, you know, and we can, we can uh, use energy efficiency. It's a big state program for weatherizing buildings and stuff like that. I'm all for it. But you look at where most of the problem is happening, it's not in Massachusetts. And um, it's the, if there's 8 billion people in the world, right? And so almost all the discussion is about 1 billion of them. And those are the ones in North America, uh, Europe, Japan, South Korea, you know, Australia, the industrialized parts of the world, it's a billion people. And so yeah, Germany can do this and that, and California can do that, and Massachusetts, that's not where the problem is going to be solved. The, and it's also not the lowest 1 billion, mostly in Africa. They don't use enough energy to re really be driving this problem. But that middle 6 billion people, in especially the big, poor, but not dirt poor countries that are coming along and trying to industrialize, you know, India, China, of course, still growing, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Brazil. South Africa, Nigeria, you know, there's like just billions of people trying to climb up out of poverty and, and doing so with some success. This, this mm. is a great accomplishment of the human race that we've, we've been lifting people from poverty, um, developing technology, feeding people better, fewer hungry people, life expectancy is longer, all those outcomes are improving. But at the same time, the only thing that matters for climate change is how much carbon we're emitting and it's going up. 
So are you going to stop it going up by telling all those people to screech to a halt in their climb out of poverty and use less energy in Indonesia, where they're already, you know, barely have enough to, to do anything with? That's just completely, it's immoral and it's unworkable. So but this all goes back to the kind of degrowth um, philosophy that emerged in the early 1970s. I mean, you know, I was there, I went to Stanford, I grew up at Stanford actually. And I was there in the, in the seminar rooms with Paul Ehrlich and this idea that there's too many people in the world and we can't sustain it as we're beyond the earth's carrying capacity. Um, we need fewer people, we need to depopulate the world. And then now it's, you know, deindustrialize the world. Um, and he's, Paul Ehrlich is still going around saying these things, but it was completely wrong. He thought people were going to starve and that, you know, the, the population would outstrip the ability to feed people, much less provide them a comfortable style of life. And it just wasn't true at all. Technology went faster than population did. and we ended up with multiples of the population back then, but but fewer hungry people. Mm -hmm. So the answer, in my view, is um, don't degrowth, don't deindustrialize, don't depopulate, but just change how you're providing energy and materials with which people make their lives. And, right. and you know, specifically, you look at places like Sweden you know, Stockholm, Paris, uh, Toronto, Chicago, these are all cities that are powered by nuclear power. And they're, they're very clean, you know, um, uh, get get into the numbers later. But um, these are clean, low carbon cities. And they're yeah. not places that people are, you know, hanging around in the cold, not eating much. <laughs> right. <laughs> nice places to live. Right. Well, I'm based in Toronto and I can confirm I'm not living in the cold. Um, yeah. So we're doing, we're doing all right. <laughs> yeah. um, just on the topic of, of degrowth and growth, uh, I, I did a previous episode with um, Josh Storrs Hall, uh, who wrote, Where's My Flying Car? Yeah. And he, uh, he spoke about the Henry Adams curve of energy usage. Basically, the last two or 300 years in America, uh, energy usage has ticked up roughly 7% per year. And there's this like exponential curve and it goes all the way up to the 1970s and then it flatlines. It turns like almost perfectly flat yeah. and it hasn't really ticked up since then. What can be done now that we've kind of recognized that some of the degrowth ideas of the seventies were wrong, um, that we, we, we don't have to be allergic to using energy. Um, what can we do to catalyze growth in the total energy usage of, of America? Well, again, America is not where the problem is here. So I'm, I am all for these efficiency measures. And it's great that we, uh, we in North America flattened out our emissions um, to a large extent. Most of that came from switching from coal to gas. Um, which is about half the carbon emission. So you can you can double your your energy use for the same amount of emissions by using gas instead of coal. Now the I think though the curve is is a energy usage curve rather than uh, rather than an emissions curve. Uh, emissions, right? Okay. So this is the decoupling of GDP from energy use, and things right. are just more efficient. You know, the, with computers, with information, um, the uh, the amount of energy that you need to produce the same amount of GDP is going down. Um, but nonetheless, if your energy use is growing, as it is with those 6 billion people, um, then you can be more efficient, but you still are going to end up using more, if you see what I mean. It's a little right. bit like the, the gasoline um, standards for cars in the United States that came in a couple decades ago. And we significantly reduced the uh, gasoline per mile that cars use in, in the whole fleet. But at the same time, people were driving more. And so you end up with a flat curve of gasoline. So is that a win because we're, we're using less per mile? Or is it a loss because we're driving more and it's canceled it out and we're still polluting the same amount as before? 
Um, mm -hmm. It's better than if better than if you didn't do those things, right? So, um, right. The, okay, let's part jump of this in. Too, I'm sorry, is that we're we're offshoring our heavy manufacturing now to China. Um, we talk about it in the film briefly. The San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge um, was assembled in China, built, you know, all the pieces of it in China and then assembled in the Bay Area and between San Francisco and Oakland. So they, they made these big steel pieces using coal, um, using, you know, all that heavy industrial process in China and then shipped them over and put them together in San Francisco. And then California's like, we don't use coal. You know, we're right. nice and coal. <laughs> <laughs> but China burns the coal for California in that case. So that, that's a piece of the whole problem. Um, but there, there is a lot of heavy industry still in the world. It's still needed. It is gradually moving out of the places like North America and Europe and, and more in Southeast Asia, China. Um, right. But, but I wanna... again, the only number that really matters is the total carbon emissions and it still hasn't even started to go down. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Sweden. Sweden was an example in the early part of the book, and you talked about how they made this transition almost without even considering this was like almost pre, you know, before all the hype about climate change really took off, Sweden had already begun to uh, decarbonize uh, their, their energy infrastructure. Can you talk about the process that Sweden went through and where they are today in relation to all the neighboring countries in, in Northern Europe? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, both Sweden and France, which are the really leading examples, along with Ontario, with you, where you are a little later, um, but both Sweden and France, they didn't build nuclear in response to climate change. In Sweden, well, let me say in France, um, it was the oil embargoes in the early 1970s and the realization that their economy was dependent on energy coming in from a foreign power that could cut it off at any time. And, uh, you know, they wanted their fate in their own hands and they built 56 nuclear reactors and, and accomplished that. It also happened to just dramatically decarbonize their grid just in 15 years from, uh, you know, mostly fossil fuel was dropped off the grid. Nuclear comes on. It's a very dramatic graph. Um, and then it's uh, 70, 80 percent nuclear. Um, so but in Sweden's case, it was the rivers. The environmentalists um, wanted them to stop damming the last free running rivers in Sweden. Sweden has a lot of hydro. So when you're talking about decarbonization, there are the lucky countries and the unlucky countries. So the lucky ones, which includes Sweden to some extent, are the ones with a lot of hydroelectric potential. Um, Brazil, Norway, New Zealand, places like that. And they can they can decarbonize pretty readily with hydro if they want to do it. That's been successful. And those are some of the lowest emitting countries relative to their GDPs. Um, and then Sweden was going down that path. The environmentalists didn't want to do it that way. And they went to nuclear instead. And they built out nuclear reactors, not quite as, as extensively as France did, but enough to um, really along with the existing hydro, um, get a clean grid and a, and a reliable grid and affordable, which are all very important. Sweden. Yeah. So then um, in recent years, like a decade ago, this gets into a complicated political issue, but I, I'm going to give me a minute here. To Let's go for it. it. The, the complication comes in these parliamentary systems of which Europe has a number of them. And Sweden was one where the Green Party, which was just adamantly anti-nuclear and Greenpeace, you know, is very much wrapped up in that um, anti-nuclear. The Green Party got some seats in Parliament and it wasn't all that many seats, but it was the critical swing votes that were needed to form a government. So the left of center party that wanted to form a government didn't have the seats to do it. But with an alliance with the Greens, they did. And so 
they formed that government and the Greens basically said, we'll support whatever you want for your government, but you have to shut down nuclear power. And the same thing happened in Belgium. Um, the same thing happened in Germany. These are places where it's not public opinion driving it. It's this sort of parliamentary quirk that lets a relatively small group um, drive policy. And there is a lot of public fear about nuclear in general. And there's been a lot of, as you know, um, negative or around it for years. So it's, it's not that hard to do it. But anyway, Sweden got this new government and they just started a transition of getting rid of nuclear power little by little. And they actually shut down a couple of reactors and they said they were going to use wind instead. And that's complicated because the wind is up in the north, which is also where the hydro is, but the people are down in the south of Sweden and the industry. So you have a transmission problem now showing up as these big gaps in electricity prices between the north of Sweden where you give away electricity for free almost and the south where it's still super expensive. Also complicated because Sweden's on an integrated grid with um, France with nuclear and Germany with coal and Poland with a lot of coal and Denmark with a lot of wind and there, there's a whole mix going on there. Um, anyway, uh, they started this process of shutting it down. And then in the last election, which was what, a year ago um, or a little more, the uh, right of center government took power and the Greens were not in anymore. And in pretty short order, they reversed course and said, this doesn't make sense to shut down nuclear. And then not long after that, actually, we want to build more nuclear. So now Sweden's on the path of getting back in the game, building nuclear. Um, and we'll see how it plays out in the specifics of what they decide to build and when and where. Um, but their intention now is to expand nuclear. So that's a long, long story about Sweden. And I probably right. left out a lot of things. Why is nuclear energy such a potent solution? Like, why why isn't Sweden deciding to double down on hydro or double down on other, you know, renewables like wind and solar, maybe pairing them with batteries? Why why nuclear? Well, that's that's a long story because each of those things has its issues and they're not the same across the board. Um, one thing I always want to do is to deconstruct the idea of so-called renewables, which mm -hmm. you think of a solar panel on the roof as sort of representing renewables, but actually the only solar that's really going at scale because it's cheaper is these big ground-based solar. And then that itself is only a tiny piece of the whole thing. And wind is much more important, but wind and solar combined are far less important than hydroelectric. So. You, you think of the solar panel on the roof, but what you're actually talking about is a big hydroelectric dam. Um, so let me talk a little more about why those are problematic solutions, and then I'll get to why nuclear is such a great um, alternative to it. Uh, so wind and solar, as we know, are unreliable um, in the sense that they come and go and not predictably, you know, sun is somewhat predictable because um, you know it's not gonna shine during two thirds of the hours of the day. Um, wind less so, um, wind, you know, blows more of the time, but you get these periods when neither one is producing. So my co-author, Stefan Quist, did an analysis of the European continent over a number of years and said, what's the, what's the period in which neither wind nor solar are available below 10%, right? On both of them for the whole continent. And the answer was there's periods, not that often, but they come along, which is a week or even two weeks like that. So now you've got like, okay, how are we gonna power a continent on something that disappears for two weeks? And this is where the, problem with batteries comes in. Um, the batteries are, I mean, there's, they're too expensive and you would need far too much volume of them to seriously back up a grid that's based on these coming and going sources of electricity. Um, well, I've got some numbers in the book about that. You know, how many Tesla mega factories, you, gigafactories you'd need to 
build, um, you know, just insanely large numbers of batteries. And what we have now that's called solar plus storage, I mean, it is solar plus storage. They build a solar farm and then they put in batteries with it, but it's not solving that problem of what do you do when you have these prolonged periods with no sun or wind. It's solving the problem of what do you do when your grid has a lot of solar on it and then the sun goes down or a cloud passes by or you know a storm comes through or something and you suddenly have, it's really the sun going down every day. You suddenly have a big crash in the generation of electricity on your system and you need to kind of buffer the grid while you crank up the natural gas to fill in for the nighttime. Um, so typically those battery installations would produce what the the solar array or whatever was what you what you're going to get out of them it would last for like 15 minutes just this little buffer and now in the last few years it's improved considerably and there's a lot of battery storage that goes for three or four hours but so the sun goes down at let's say five in the afternoon and then um your batteries crank in until nine at night and then and then they're empty and the solar's not producing and maybe you don't have wind that night so what are you going to do for backup? And in every case, really, every significant case, the backup is natural gas. Um, you burn natural gas because um, it's cheap and you can turn it on and off pretty easily. It makes natural gas the perfect partner for wind and solar, which is exactly what the natural gas companies say in, in so many words. Mm. We have a... a I was just looking again at a Washington Post insert section paid for by the American Petroleum Institute. This is what the gas people are saying. And, that, and it's called why natural gas will thrive in an age of renewables. And this is why, because if you want to build a hybrid system, so gas is half the carbon emissions of coal, not counting methane leaks, which we'll have to talk about at some point. Um, and then you, you, supplement it it's really supplementing the gas with the wind and solar not the other way around um, is how i look at it but you know when you have the solar blazing away turn off your gas plants and run the grid on solar so now you're bringing it down from that half of coal to you know less than that and that's a hybrid system that is lower emission than coal you know considerably lower but it's not a zero emission system. You're still adding carbon all the time and you're still increasing energy use all the time. Those 6 billion people are gonna double, trip. but by 2050, they're likely to triple or quadruple or even five fold today's total electricity use in the world. So you see, if you, if you drop the emissions per kilowatt hour in the ideal, you get down from a coal level to a natural gas to a hybrid of natural gas, wind, and solar. And let's say you're down to one third of the emissions, which would be fantastic, right? And then the world energy use triples, and you're right back where we are now. You, know, you haven't solved the problem. So it's that difference between kind of partial measures, half steps, building a bridge halfway across a river versus actually solving the problem where we can grow energy use without increasing carbon emissions. So that's the wind and solar. Hydroelectric is a fantastic resource from a climate change point of view. It's cheap, it's no carbon, I mean, it's some carbon embedded in the concrete of building the dams and stuff. Um, and, um, and you can turn it on and off when you need to. So if, if uh, the demand goes down, you just let less water through the dam. And it's fantastic for working with sun and wind because if they diminish, you open up the dam and let through more hydro. If you've got a blazing sun day and you don't need more electricity, then you close off the dam. Um, it has a couple of downsides though, one of which is what the Swedish environmentalists didn't like in the first place and what I never liked about hydro. And the Sierra Club, which originally had a campaign called Atoms Not Dams, you know, use nuclear power so we don't need to build dams, exactly what the Swedes did. Um, and, you know, it floods whole ecosystems, huge areas. And if you look right now in the Mekong River Delta in Southeast Asia, that's a huge watershed uh, with a very large and, and diverse 
ecosystem and it's just being destroyed by all the hydro being built there. So that's a downside if you're an, a kind of old fashioned environmentalist like me. Um, and it also has the downside that um, it's weather dependent. You know, if you have a big drought, California's had this recently, you know, like, okay, we've got our hydro, now we're all set for carbon free energy generation. And then there's a drought and there's no water in the reservoirs. And then, you know, there goes your electricity generation. And then right. you wish you had something else to back it up. Um, what are the other options? I guess so geothermal. That, geothermal is um, so far historically has been limited to places like Iceland. Um, and a few places in California and stuff where there's volcanic activity and you can basically just drill a hole in the earth and get some real hot heat out from it and generate electricity from it. It's, it's great, but it's just limited to those locations. The same way hydro, I mean, I said it earlier, but it's limited. Do you have to have the right geography to do it? Um, and, and you need the right geography for geothermal. Now, in the last just year and two years, um, there have been a number of companies that are working on uh, advanced geothermal, hot rock geothermal, or just deep geothermal. So the idea here is you go to a place where there's not volcanic activity um, and you just go deep into the earth. If you go deep enough, it gets hot enough and you can generate your electricity from that. There's a company called Fervo, F-E-R-V-O, out west that's doing this now they just have their first actually generating electricity there's another company called sage s-a-g-e that's sort of behind them and there's several others out there in that space and it also has the advantage that you can um, obviously turn it on and off as needed for the grid and you can even use it for energy storage because if you're pumping your working fluid down there to get hot and come back up, you can pump it down when there's a lot of extra electricity on the grid, and then you can retrieve it back up when there's a big demand and not enough electricity. And of course, as that means prices. You know, you pump it down when electricity is cheap, and you get it back up when electricity is expensive. So that's that's a pretty good model. It's one of my favorite, other than nuclear. Um, approaches, and I think we should be going all out on that um, to, uh, to the extent we can. There's uh, fusion power sort of off in the future. I hope it works. I hope there's a big breakthrough. Haven't seen it yet. Um, and it just seems like it's probably going to be pretty expensive and pretty far off in the future. I mean, decades before it really yeah. kicks in. So it's not a proven solution. Um, and then there's uh, biomass is a little bit of a scandal because it's counted as green energy because um, you cut down a tree and then eventually another tree will grow up in its place. So it's, it's considered renewable. This gets to why the term renewable doesn't make much sense. It all goes back to the 1970s when people thought that um, fossil fuels were going to run out. And uranium was going to run out. Uh, so it's the whole idea of limited, again, discounting that technology is going to make more of these things available as time went along. So they thought, no, we only have a limited amount of oil and it's going to run out. We're going to have peak oil. Uranium will run out. Everything will run out. And the renewables were the things that wouldn't run out because they would keep refreshing themselves. Water, wind, solar, and biomass. Um, but that's where the resemblance with biomass and you know that's where the that ends because biomass when you burn it it's as dirty as coal or even dirtier and yeah the tree will grow back eventually someday but um that's off in the future so it it doesn't it doesn't really add up and you get there's there's some good ways to do biomass where you use wood products that aren't being used otherwise um, and so forth. But there's also the bad biomass and a lot of it where Germany will come over to North America, cut down forests, ship the logs over to Europe and burn them and then say, we're clean <laughs> right. while we're putting up all this carbon into the atmosphere from burning that wood. Same as coal. Okay. So did we run out of our, you know, our options? 
I think that's a good overview of the ones that are not going to power the future. What about nuclear? Wait, Uh, no, why is that so special? Carbon capture is another important one um, Mm. that uh, the the green groups don't like it, but I like it, except that it doesn't work yet and uh, it's too expensive. But the efforts to capture the carbon and and put the carbon underground um, with coal have not proven really economical and feasible. But there is a company doing it with natural gas called Net Power, NET. Um, <clears throat> fantastic idea. The founder talks about uh, hydrocarbons being like a bunch of grapes. You know, the, the carbon down the middle, that's the stem, and then the hydrogens on the outside are the grapes. And what you want to do is get the energy out of the hydrogen, peel the grapes off, and then throw the stem away. And that's what Net Power is doing with natural gas, you burn it through a new technology that's supposedly going to be as cheap as regular gas plants. I haven't seen that actually happen yet. They're building their demonstration plant now in Texas. Um, but, uh, but then what comes out of it is the energy, electricity, and then a stream of carbon dioxide that is sequestered and you can put it back down underground where you got it from. Um, Side note, none of these are any good for Massachusetts. Uh, (laughs) You can't use the natural gas, the carbon sequestration because we don't have the right underground storage. We'd have to build pipelines back to Pennsylvania, which is where we get our gas from. Um, And then you could do it, you know, run the gas up here, burn it in these plants and run the CO2 back to Pennsylvania. Not sure that's gonna be economical. Um, We don't have good geothermal uh, geology here. The wind is quite limited. The offshore wind, we didn't really talk about, but it's it's got a a steadier supply of wind offshore, but it's really expensive and that's hitting home in the last six months, year, um, that contracts are being broken and companies are going bust. And, you know, the offshore wind is turning out to be a lot harder than was hoped. Um, So we have some of that. There's hope to build uh, big transmission lines from Quebec, where there's a lot of hydro and bring in clean hydro to Massachusetts. People in Maine don't want it running through their state. And, you know, New York and even Ontario want access to that Quebec hydro. So it's not quite clear if everybody's going to think it's their solution and then there's not enough to go around. And uh, yeah, we got rid of coal, we went to gas. We used to have a third coal, a third gas, a third nuclear and a third, I'm sorry, a quarter each of those and a quarter um, uh, everything else. And then we got rid of the nuclear in Massachusetts, we got rid of the coal and now it's three quarters gas and a quarter everything else. So gas is just in this dominant position in what's called the energy transition, but is kind of the, the energy half transition. So then, mm-hmm. like I said, you look in your bag of tricks, what's in there, nuclear. And, and what makes nuclear different is its concentration of energy. Um, it's a million times more concentrated than fossil fuel, a million times, not like two or three times more, not 10 times more, not a thousand, it's a million times more. So, and it just shapes everything that's so great about it, as well as what scares people, because it's so potent. Um, And it's starting with the mining, you know, that's a lot less mining that has to happen. Mining is dirty, whether it's coal, uranium or whatever, but with uranium, you need to mine a lot less of it. Transportation, the size of the plants is incredibly smaller and less of a a footprint on the land than um, especially solar and wind and these kind of um, things that are less concentrated than fossil fuels. you look at a nuclear plant and it's uh, it's this tiny little thing. There was a plant in Massachusetts. We had one um, in Plymouth, Massachusetts on the shore south of Boston. They shut it down five years ago. And that one site, if you, and I wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe I, when they shut it down and said, why don't we just bring in this South Korean plant that they've built in South Korea. Now they've almost finished it all four reactors in uh, the United Arab Emirates and they're getting ready to build it in Poland. So it's uh, four big reactors 
and you could put them on this site less than one square mile and it would produce 80% of Massachusetts electricity needs, you know, from one square mile. So it's that incredible concentration. And then on the, on the waste side also, the waste streams are so small and so contained that it's just ironic that it's a big talking point against nuclear. It should be the biggest point in favor of it, that the waste is contained, the waste is solid, and uh, and it's such a small volume. No other right. energy source can say that. Certainly not coal, where the waste just is a gas that goes up into the air. The particulate matter goes up and kills people every day of the year. Um, nuclear never, nobody's ever been harmed by nuclear waste, right? So spent fuel. And talk about the turning points in my thinking about nuclear. I went and visited the Vermont Yankee plant, which is uh, not far from where I live and used to be where we got ele our electricity from. It was shut down in 2014 for political reasons. And, uh, and I visited it not too long after it shut down. And I went out and saw the spent fuel casks. They're, they're 18 feet high cylinders, concrete cylinders and steel. Um, the concrete contains the radiation. You can stand there right next to them with no protective gear or anything because they're completely shielded. The radiation's totally shielded. The cask is so strong, it'll withstand earthquakes or floods or anything that happens to it. Um, and it sits there. There were, there's like a few dozen of these casks and it represents decades of electricity that this plant made you know, large scale plant for decades. And I just remember standing right next to these casks and saying, wait, this is what all the fuss is about. You know, mm -hmm. this is like so the least worrisome thing I've ever seen. Um, so that's it, it's so concentrated. And also because it's so concentrated, it's really fast to build. Um, when I said how France just decarbonized the whole grid in 15 years um, using nuclear, and if you look at studies of uh, different ways countries have added clean energy that is low carbon energy to the grid, the 10 fastest additions of energy to the grid relative to the size of an economy, um, nine of them have been nuclear power. I think one was mm -hmm. wind. Um, so it's, it's ironic. The, the very arguments that people make against nuclear energy are actually its strongest um, points. And that is, they say it's dangerous, it's um, too slow to build, and it's too expensive. So we, we can talk more about the expensive, um, but it's been the fastest to build. It's been by far the safest of major energy sources compared to fossil fuel, you know, hundreds of times safer than coal. Um, and uh, and it's been affordable places like France that did it right and that did it decades ago, rolled out a bunch of reactors of the same design, you know, sort of serial production um, and and based their grid on it. And France had like half the electricity prices of uh, surrounding countries. Yeah. So um, and here in Massachusetts, like that Vermont Yankee plant that they shut down five years ago. Or, that was 10 years ago, um, it was producing at less than five cents a kilowatt hour. So I don't know if you look at your electricity bill, mine, I'm paying, you know, retail price of 31 cents now a kilowatt hour. Wow. And the offshore wind projects that they said they were going to re replace these nuclear plants with were, it's all pretty secretive, but they were bidding them in at something like 20 cents a kilowatt hour. And now they can't build them for that price. They need more than that, right? So you're replacing something same thing with Plymouth plant, uh, the Pilgrim plant in Plymouth, south of Boston, five cents a kilowatt hour, and you're replacing it with something that's 20 cents a kilowatt hour. So when you, when you do that, it's very hard on the economy. It's really hard on industries and businesses. Um, Massachusetts is uh, a low energy use relative to GDP place. We're one of the lowest states in the US for that because the things that drive our economy, education, healthcare, biotech, computers, um, they don't use much energy. Germany's had a harder time of it. They make things like cars uh, that do use energy. 
Um, and there's currently a bit of deindustrialization happening in Germany because the prices have gone up and the electricity supply is unreliable. Companies right. are moving, moving out. Well, companies moving to the US where natural gas is cheap. And uh, I just saw that they're, they're going to get a ton of electric cars built in China now. Uh, Germany yeah. used to build cars, right? <laughs> There's, here is the three car uh, capital. Why are right, people so, so that, afraid that's of it. That, that They're dangerous, expensive, and too slow to build each of the three. It's the exact opposite of that. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered platform for generating high quality transcripts of all your audio or video content. They combine AI engines and hundreds of human workers all over the world who are paid over the Lightning Network to assemble these transcripts. And that's what lets Stackwork create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. If you want to learn more about Stackwork, visit stackwork.com. That is S-T-A-K work.com. I know all sorts of stories of technologies that people were once afraid of that now are just so benign, like you know, in the seventies, when, when TVs started becoming popular, everyone said they'd turn your brain to mush. And now, right. now we stick phones in our face, like an inch away. And now we have Apple vision pro and it's stuck to our head. Right. And so right. why Cell is phones that going to give you cancer? And actually yeah. as you're reading a few years ago, how, when trains were first invented, People were freaked out about the danger of riding on a train because it was going to accelerate and go so fast that your brain would be smushed to the back of your head and these yeah. horrible consequences would ensue. So how do and we get around those problems, those fears, but we haven't been able to get around the fear of, of nuclear, which I suspect a lot of it is due to Chernobyl back 40 years ago. Um, yeah. Why is that still so, so fearful? It starts much earlier than that. And I don't think it's just Chernobyl because, you know, there've been horrific plane crashes and we get over them and we get back on a plane. Maybe we are afraid of flying because um, it's sort of unnatural, but, um, you know, and if the plane crashes, you're going to die, but, um, but it's so convenient. Um, and we, you know, <laughs> it works and we realize rationally that the planes very seldom crash. When they do, we figure out what went wrong and fix it. And so there's fewer and fewer crashes. Uh, it's been a long time since Chernobyl and um, Fukushima didn't kill anybody. So that you can see that the fear is not based in a kind of rational worry um, uh, about how many people will be killed if something goes wrong. Um, now it goes way back to the, uh, to the bomb and mm. World War II and, um, at that time, this is, this is a bit of a long story. I'm trying to figure out how we might disaggregate it. Um, do you want to go into a, a long story? Go about for it, the, yeah. Early, Let's hear it. early days. So here's the deal. Um, there was, we start from the bomb in 1945 and the war ends and the people in the Rockefeller Foundation realized that they funded the critical work that led to the creation of the bomb and they feel kind of guilty about it. Now, in the years, the 10 years or so, 15 years after 1945, there was a big, uh, a big campaign around atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. So we, we dropped the bomb on two cities. It's the only time that's happened. But then we went testing bigger and bigger bombs and the Russians got the bomb and they were testing it, and the Chinese were testing it, French were testing. And each one of these tests, there were hundreds of them. And each one was unlike a nuclear power plant. These were just blowing up, you know, big chain reaction, the biggest you can get and just spewing out all the byproducts into the atmosphere. And it turned out that it, it spread low level radioactivity around the world and you could start to find strontium-90 in mother's milk and stuff like that. So it was a good one for building fears around. And the Rockefeller Foundation, starting right then in the late 40s, decided that if they could make people afraid of low-level radiation, then, then it would stop the atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. That uh, was part of a whole campaign that was going on. Mothers Strike for Peace and these groups were 
the scientists were agitating on this. And the whole issue here was that the military sort of initially just saw the bomb as a big artillery shell, like it was just a bigger bang and especially a bigger bang for your buck, you know, because they did the same thing to Tokyo that they did to Hiroshima not long before the firebombing and a similar effect, similar number of people killed. Um, but it was, you know, it took hundreds of airplanes to do that, but now you could do it with one airplane, one bomb. Um, so they, they thought that was great, the military, <laughs> but, um, the scientists wanted to have people understand that this was a different kind of weapon and they wanted to create a taboo against it. Um, which to their credit, you know, they did do, and we haven't blown off any nuclear weapons yet since then to, to blow up cities with, um, and the way to, to get this taboo is to make people afraid of the low level radiation. That way it would force an end to the atmospheric testing. And if you couldn't test your weapons, you couldn't develop them and the arms race would kind of grind to a halt. That was the theory of it. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation at that time was a major funder of science. Like now the government funds basic research, but back then it was these foundations, a few big foundations and above all the Rockefeller Foundation funding all the science. And they found a guy named Joseph, uh, named Herman Joseph Muller, who was um, a down on his luck scientist, divorced, broke, unemployed, had it had a suicide attempt, right? But he was the guy that had, in the late 1920s, zapped fruit flies with radiation, high level radiation, lots of it, and produced these grotesque mutations in the fruit flies like, you know, an ear where the eye should be or something. So it had a good sort of horror factor, good film value, you could say. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and it demonstrated the danger of radiation. At that time, it was mutations everyone was worried about. Later, it got to be cancer. Radiation will give you cancer. So, um, so they scooped this guy up in 1945 and arranged for him to have a professorship at Indiana University. Sorry. And, uh, and the Rockefeller Foundation paid his salary, his lab expenses, his research costs, travel, um, everything, right? All paid for by them. And Indiana University is like, okay, sounds good to us. You know, we're getting a free professor. And then the next year, 1946, he wins the Nobel Prize um, for his work on radiating fruit flies probably because everyone was thinking about radiation since Hiroshima the previous year. So now they've backed the right horse. Um, they've got a guy who's spreading this and they build the whole field of genetics, funding everybody to back this view of this guy. Not only was high level radiation going to cause grotesque mutations, which he had proven, but that low level radiation was also dangerous because DNA couldn't repair itself. And, they didn't know the structure of DNA yet. That would come in 1953. But, um, but they knew that there was something called, you know, they called um, genes that were affected by radiation and causing mutations. Um, and since he assumed that the damage from radiation to these genes was cumulative over time, the genes couldn't repair themselves. It's like this mechanistic idea. The DNA is the code. The code plays itself out in the organism. And if you damage it over time, it's going to get worse and worse. Um, no way to, to repair it. Okay, so they build this whole field around this concept that low-level radiation is just as harmful as high-level radiation, even though evidence begins to pile up almost right away that that's not true. And for example, the bombing victims in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, some of them were very close to the blast, some of them were far from the blast, they got different doses of radiation. So you'd think you would find some difference in the effects, um, you know, little effects as you get further away. And that's kind of generally true. But what you didn't find was any evidence that the lower levels from the people farther away were causing any health effects. So there's an alternative version, an alternative theory called the threshold theory that says that up to a certain amount, your body can handle low level radiation. And then above that, it can't. Um, I think of it kind of like my 
coffee, you know, if I drink one or two cups of coffee, it's fine. But if I drink a hundred cups, I'm going to die. You know, it's like body can't right. handle it all at once. Um, so, uh, so this evidence piles up and the scientists are trying to figure out what's what. And the Rockefeller Foundation are always putting their thumb on the scale like, no, we, we want to support what Mueller is doing. Um, it all culminates in a uh, conference called the Biological Effects of Atomic Radiation in 1956. This is right after Eisenhower had introduced his Atoms for Peace program. He went and spoke to the UN about how we can use nuclear energy to bring humanity together and provide energy in the poor parts of the world. And we're going to use um, atomic energy, not, not for war, but for peace. That was a great speech. Um, and so the response by the Rockefeller Foundation is get this conference together, BEAR, B Biological Effects of Atomic Radiation, BEAR, 1956. They come out with their report. The whole thing was funded with Rockefeller money. Um, and they got the National Academy of Sciences to be like the sponsor of it, but they paid for it all. And they got all the geneticists in one room. They had six committees looking at different aspects of this question of what affected it radiation have on health and the like the medical people were like we don't see any effect of it at low levels and must be a threshold model um and they all you know five of the committees didn't really see this problem but the genetics committee they said oh yeah it's dangerous down to the lowest you know there is no threshold one little zap of the tiniest bit of radiation will cause lasting harm and they promoted that model. The Rockefeller Foundation didn't have a geneticist in charge of that committee. They put their own guy, Warren Weaver, director, the, the guy who was giving out the money to the genetics field, they put him in charge of it. He got in there with, in the room with these guys and said, look, if we come out with the right answer here, there's gonna be a lot of money for everybody. And they were all funded by the Rockefellers and it was packed with Mueller followers. So that's how they got this thing sort of set up as the scientific, you know, sort of leading theory. And then from there it got embodied into policy um, in a, a, a model called linear no threshold. So the effect of radiation is linear. The more you get, the more harm it does. And there's no threshold right down to zero. Um, and it's all based on this idea that DNA cannot repair itself. So if I can just skip forward to the 2015 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, it's given to three guys who showed in great detail how DNA repairs itself. You know, like <laughs> incredible repair mechanisms working all the time. And of course, we evolved on a planet full of radiation. DNA gets zapped all the time. Actually, oxidation causes more DNA damage than radiation does. But in any case, it repairs itself and the organism goes on. So Mueller's theory was wrong. It's definitively been proven wrong. And yet to this day, we have this um, policy orientation, linear, no threshold. It governs the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Nuclear Safety Regulatory Commission in Canada, and all around the world. You should try to, because any tiny amount is harmful for health. Um, right. Now, the Rockefeller Fortune, of course, was based on oil. And in those days, the family was much more in control of the foundation. Not long after that, it sort of split off and became independent from the family. And there's even one piece of this philanthropic Rockefeller world, now the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, I think it's called, that is like disinvesting from fossil fuels because they care about climate change. So I'm not, I'm not saying the Rockefeller Foundation is a bad institution. But at that time, there was a lot of family in influence. It was tied up with oil. It may have influenced, like they felt guilty about the bomb, but maybe they also had in mind that a new clean energy source like Eisenhower was talking about was going to be bad for business for their whole way of life, which was about oil. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever reason, they did succeed in ending atmospheric testing. 1963, the treaty was signed. No more atmospheric tests of nuclear weapons. But what happened was the tests were moved underground 
where the byproducts wouldn't be spread around in the atmosphere and the arms race went on. So they completely failed to stop the arms race. Um, but they did, um, I guess, uh, on the plus side of their efforts, they did help to make this taboo against nuclear weapons, that this is something really scary and really different. Um, but it had this horrible side effect that then people were afraid of nuclear power. Um, and, right. and this was also underlined at the time by uh, the Godzilla movies, started in the, I think, 1956, I believe, was uh, Godzilla came to the United States and that, you know, Godzilla was a mutation caused by radiation. And then, huh. and then there was this series of movies and they all, most all of them had some kind of nuclear radiation at the beginning of it and then some horrible monster at the end. Then you got the things like Spider-Man started, starts with radioactivity and then, but he gets good powers, you know, <laughs> still they're kind of freakish. You wouldn't want them. And then, as I said, the, the focus shifted because they studied very carefully the survivors for generations after the atomic bombings in Japan, and there wasn't any evidence of mutation. So the, the evident, the effort shifted onto cancer, and there was some evidence that um, the higher levels of radiation caused leukemia. Um, that's well established. Uh, I mean, high, high level radiation can definitely do a lot of damage and, and certainly kill you if you get enough of it. Um, as for instance, in Chernobyl, or in the atomic bombings. Um, but the, uh, the, the, sh the shift was that now we were worried about cancer, not mutations so much. Um, that if you get a tiny about, amount of radiation, it'll cause cancer. And, and then this plays out in situations where there's a large population exposed to a very small amount of radiation. For instance, people who lived across Europe when the Chernobyl accident happened and there was this cloud of radiation that spread around Europe. And so supposedly, although the radiation levels were very small, there were so many people affected by it that under this linear no threshold, you could assume that X number of people were gonna die of cancer no such thing ever was measurable. And so you're dealing with a phenomenon that's too small to measure and yet assumed to be true. And to my mind, that's just not science, right? Right. Like, we know it's there, but we can't measure it. We can't see it, but it's out there. <laughs> um, so now that we have an understanding that there is a threshold at which, you know, if you're below a certain threshold, this low level radiation is not as harmful or, or maybe not harmful at all. Yeah. Um, now that we know that, why are we still seeing so much? It feels like today, I think you, you alluded to in the book, a number of places that are shutting down nuclear reactors. There still seems to be like a, a divestment from nuclear. Why is that still persisting now that we have all this understanding? Well, in the this came together, this um, uh, fear of radioactivity came together in the 1970s with the environmentalists, the Paul Ehrlich type people, um, and his friend David Brower, who was actually the guy that got him to write that book, The Population Bomb in 1968. David Brower was the head of the Sierra Club, and the Sierra Club was pro-nuclear for all their the right environmental reasons. And then David Brower left the Sierra Club and founded um, Friends of the Earth, which was specifically anti-nuclear power. Huh. Um, and then his faction got control again in the Sierra Club and they flipped and became anti-nuclear power. And then all the green groups were against nuclear power. It was um, partly on, because they didn't want nuclear power to produce cheap, clean you know, electricity, in abundance because then if you have cheap electricity in your wall socket, you're gonna to wanna to plug stuff into it. And so people would get more stuff and there'd be economic growth and then it would people would have more babies and you know, sort of the whole thing would just be more, more, more. 
and they had this view that resources were limited and you had to stay live within the the limit the era of limits is what jerry brown called it when he was governor of california um and okay so <laughs> go back to your question state your question again so why why today are we still so fearful so why are we still because so the green groups found this fear of radioactivity to be very potent. They merged kind of with the anti-war groups that ban the bomb people um, who were against nuclear war, peace movement things. And a lot of activists who after the Vietnam War ended, they didn't really have an issue. And they sort of flipped over from Vietnam War to anti-nuclear power. And this movement grew against nuclear power um, based on the fear of radioactivity. And they weren't reading the latest scientific reports and they had a lot of policy influence. In the 1970s, we put in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, originally, the Atomic Energy Commission had this dual uh, mission to promote the use of nuclear energy for its benefits to society, and at the same time, regulate it and make sure it was safe, right? And then when we had the Nuclear Regulatory Commission replace it, um, they only have one half of that mission. Their mission is to make sure that nuclear energy never hurts anybody. And if they regulate it so heavily that they shut it all down, that's good. Then it doesn't hurt anybody. And they're, if you instead burn coal and kill millions of people that way, that's not their department, right? So it became this focus on the safety issue and the, and the groups that were already against nuclear energy focused on this linear no threshold as a way of driving up the costs of nuclear and driving it out of business, which pretty well worked. So now if you had the original nuclear plants, the ones that were generating at five cents a kilowatt hour um, were replaced by new generations, one after the other that each had, they were safe or they had more safety features. And then when you had an accident, um, new safety features were introduced all over the world to make sure that accident couldn't happen anywhere else. And it's all this kind of drive to zero accidents, zero releases of radioactivity. Um, so you have a, a nuclear reactor with some coolant loop in it and, you know, but it's possible that what's in the coolant loop is a little bit radioactive. So you put in a second coolant loop, or you just kind of keep adding on to the plants until they get very complicated and very expensive. This was magnified in the United States with the plants that are just opening in Georgia, two reactors at the Bodle plant in Georgia, because they had already gotten approved and started construction on that plant when the Fukushima accident happened. And suddenly a whole slew of new regulations came into existence and, um, and they had to like go back and meet all those requirements. The whole thing got extremely expensive. I mean, it's an example of that. They had a plan that was approved by the NRC for the rebar in the concrete. And in the design drawing, they had just sketched in rebar in the concrete, right? And then when they actually built it, the configuration of the rebar was not exactly what they had sketched in. It's absolutely equally as good, same idea. They just hadn't built it the way they had sketched it, which was more conceptual. And the NRC made them rip the whole thing out and rebuild it. And you know, the whole project was delayed for six months while money is bleeding out and so forth. All for these kind of like hyper-regulated um, things. It, it takes still 10 years and a billion dollars just to get a license application approved for a new reactor. And new reactor design and who's got a billion dollars to wait a decade not getting any return on your investment and with no assurance that they're going to approve it um right the smaller ones that are we'll talk about probably the smrs small modular reactors but the first through the gate out of oregon and um they were considered a great triumph in navigating the regulation because it's just the same technology as all the plants that have already been approved, but it's scaled down and they managed to get their approval for it in uh, 
half a billion dollars in 10 years. <laughs> so, okay. And then they were going to build a, a plant in Idaho to provide municipal utilities out in the Midwest with electricity. And by the time they could, before they ever got to construction, and they don't have a license for construction for that matter, and they just, the whole thing collapsed last year, too expensive, right? The costs just keep getting driven up. But inherently, because it's so concentrated, um, it should be the cheapest source of energy out there. And when we first started doing it, it was. It's competitive with coal, um, which is pretty cheap. Dig it up and burn it. Um, but mm -hmm. now it's just not competitive anymore. So this is, to my mind, the most important thing in the whole nuclear space right now is to figure out how to bring the costs down. And the reason is that if you if you build something like this new scale project in Idaho, um, even at the cost before it escalated in the last couple of years, it's too expensive for people to build that in Indonesia if they can burn coal instead. And so you need something that'll compete in those poor countries. And again, the 1 billion people in Europe and North America um, can maybe afford to pay more for clean energy, but the people in um, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they can't afford that. India, above all, you know, this is such a big place and so much energy growth going on. And they're three quarters coal. And the government says, we're going to be three quarters coal into the foreseeable future. Just the reality of, you know, we need electricity. We really need electricity. And they're just finally getting everybody on the grid. Demand is going up fast. And just they need the cheapest, most reliable easiest technology that they can build fast and that's coal right so if you come in with well here's this like complicated nuclear power plant that's been approved by the nrc in the united states but it's going to take 10 years to get approval for it and and then another 10 years to build it and then it's going to be too expensive and all it's not going to work for india they need right. nuclear that's that's cheap and there are some promising developments along those lines um, if, but if that 10 year work. development horizon and that billion dollar cost, that seems to be a regulation imposed on Americans. Would India actually have to face that same burden or could India get a plant up and running in two years for a hundred million dollars? If they wanted to uh, change the regulatory framework, they could do that. The trouble is everybody looks to the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission as the gold standard, so-called. And so, I mean, I was talking with some people in South Korea about this, that the Korean investors, they want the thing that NRC has approved. So they're like, well, we want new scale and you know, new scale collapses in their first attempt. Um, maybe they'll have more success, you know, in, in later efforts. But um, meanwhile, the company that I really like is called Thorcon and they're um, uh, some Americans that are, have a deal with Indonesia to build cheap nuclear power plants in Indonesia. And the company was started by ship builders who understand the techniques of shipyard production, which is you know, putting out complicated machinery. I mean, think about a cruise ship or a big natural gas platform, um, uh, LNG tanker and stuff. Um, and and they produce them really cheaply in shipyards, especially in South Korea, which is the most advanced shipyards in the world in Busan. So they want to, um, and they've got the whole designs are out there. They've got the deals with the shipyards to build their their power plant. It's going to be like a, a half a gigawatt, half of a full size reactor, but they're going to come in pairs, build them in the shipyard float them to where they're going, plug them in at shore. There's cheap electricity for Indonesia. It's cheap as coal. And then Indonesia will build them, right? But if it's three times the price of coal, they won't. Um, the right. trouble with Thorcon is they don't have a government behind it. They bypass the NRC. They're not trying to get NRC approval. And then these people like the South Korean investors are like, well, we want the gold standard NRC. And it all is back to like, we're afraid of it. And we, you know, what if something goes wrong? And, what if there's a release of radioactivity, et cetera? Um, yeah. So they need a billion dollars to like build the first one. And, and 
get it all running. And after that, it's going to pay for itself and grow really fast and, you know, could make a huge difference. But so far, nobody wants to put a billion dollars in. And it's, it's, you know, there's a good chance you'd lose your billion dollars. But if you didn't lose it, you'd have made a really big difference and you'd make a ton of money on it. So it's like super high risk, big bucks. Um, and right. this is all out of like the difference between being able to do something in a practical way, like you would build a big ship versus do it in a, a highly regulated way where your sort of your main goal is to not have any radioactivity released and your secondary goal is to produce cheap electricity. Now, because these later, these more modern nuclear reactors seem to be pretty safe, as you mentioned, the Fukushima accident did not involve any, it did not have any deaths associated with the, the nuclear component. Um, yeah. Is the regulation being imposed by the NRC, is this uh, maybe a bias from the population bomb days where the regulation is kind of uh, covering up this like concern that if we do have too much, you know, cheap electricity, we're going to run out of resources? Or is this really honestly coming from a place of safety? Because it seems from, from your book and from all, all the research I've read, nuclear is generally pretty safe. So I, I'm still mystified as to why this is such a regulatory burden for something that is actually very safe. Yeah, it's not pretty safe. It's extremely safe. It has yeah. been historically. Um, and the, the old population bomb idea is not so salient anymore. Um, but the, of course, the fossil fuel industry doesn't like it. And then the Greens don't like it. So the climate, the right, the conservatives um, like nuclear energy, but they don't really care about climate change. It's not that urgency to build a lot fast. And the people who care about climate change, the green groups don't like nuclear and just are in some denial about being able to do without it. Um, so it's, it's a little complicated politically. The Democratic Party in the United States is split on it. Um, the, the newer technologies, the advanced reactors, um, and we could talk about some of those, but there's a bunch of startup companies trying to build different, a little bit different reactors than what we have, um, generally smaller, trying to be cheaper, trying to make something that you can mass manufacture. And that- Are these small them. module reactors? Is that yeah, the term? small module reactors. And micro reactors, even smaller. Um, but so there's pretty good political consensus on those being good, although the green groups still don't like them. But like in the US Congress, both Democrats and Republicans like those. And this company, New Scale, for instance, that I was just talking about, I heard their CEO say they got great support from Rick Perry when he was energy secretary under Trump. And they got great support from Ernie Moniz when he was energy secretary under Obama. And I know that they have from Jennifer Granholm under Biden, too. So it, the administrations come and go, but there's a good bipartisan, solid support in Congress. Now, Congress has trouble getting anything done, but this is an area where they, they could get more done. But the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is, uh, they're on their own with just this, they don't answer to the you know, they're an independent agency and their mission is just to make sure it never hurts anyone, not that you ever can actually build any or that or make a contribution with it. They say right. like flat out with the social and economic consequences are not our concern. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is the problem if we go the next 10, 20, 30 years without any substantial investment in nuclear? What what can you lay out the consequences for America and for the world if if this if nuclear kind of just doesn't take off for the next few decades? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to question the assumption there because a lot is changing. There is investment coming in. There is uh, bipartisan support and a fair amount of government money now to to uh, develop these new reactors and to keep the existing power plants running. Um, and the United States is not where the action is even 
So it's much better in some other places. I mentioned Sweden's going to build new reactors, and now France has changed their mind, and they're going to build new reactors. And UK is going to build, Poland's going to build a bunch. Um, and uh, China's building a new reactor, putting a new nuclear power plant on the grid every two to three months. So they're going along. I mean, they need a lot more than that if they're going to use it as a, a kind of main backbone of their energy economy. They're just building everything, but they are building a lot more than anyone else in the world. Russia has a lot. And Canada is a real bright spot um, because the regulatory commission there is more technical and less political than in the United States, sort of easier to work with. And Canada's had such a, a success in Ontario, um, getting rid of coal, making a really clean grid and um, you know, nuclear plus wind pretty much now. Uh, and so American, that is the United States companies are, are moving up to Canada now to get licensed and build their first ones up there because it's so much easier and more practical to do that. Among them, um, General Electric Hitachi, which has a small modular reactor, uh, 10th generation of boiling water reactor. And it's about a, a third to a quarter the size of their big standard um, boiling water reactor, which is, these are one of the two forms of light water reactor, which is most of what, um, almost all of what's out there um, in the world's nuclear power plants now. So GE Hitachi is going to Canada. They're gonna build the first one there in Ontario. And then they're going to come build some in the United States and in other countries. Their plant, um, they're going to build a lot of it in the factory, they build the reactor in the factory, go out to the site, dig a hole in the ground, drop the reactor in, you know, put a building around it. It's kind of like that. So to me, it's very promising in terms of getting the costs down. And yeah, it's big enough to provide a lot of electricity. So um, we'll see how that goes. So the, the consequence, if, if all that ground to a halt or if it didn't keep accelerating um, and nuclear wasn't going to be built, um, is that we really won't be able to get the carbon emissions to come down, certainly not down quickly. Maybe, they, maybe they'll peak and sort of wander their way a little bit down. It means more carbon in the atmosphere all the time. Climate change will get worse. And the the difficult thing, as we said earlier, is that by the time we see that's happening and feel the effects of it, you know, it's like 50 years too late. <laughs> Why didn't we do something back in the 2020s when we had the chance or the 2000s <laughs> or the 1980s or sometime? Um, yeah. But Can you we speak stayed to on the... track in, in the 1970s. The United States was on track to build out nuclear power to be basically the way we make electricity and to electrify our transportation and building heat and those things. And just what we're talking about now, we were on track to do that in the 1970s. And then presumably the rest of the world would have followed suit. And we literally would not have the climate problem that we have now. So it's, it's pretty striking how we got off track with it. And Can you getting speak to back on is, is hard, but if, if we, you know, if we didn't get back to that track, we're going to keep going off course. Yeah. Can you speak to the improvements that we've seen in different generations of uh, nuclear reactors, like from the first generation ones to the second, third, fourth? How, what, what are we actually seeing? Are we seeing efficiency improvements? Are we seeing like total power output improvements? Are we seeing just smaller land use? What, what are the improvements? Is it, is it far safer? Well, no, I don't, I'm not sure it is improving because um, the early ones were cheaper, so they've gotten more expensive. We have more safety features now, but you're, that's something that it's already super safe. So right. I, I used to say, <laughs> people didn't want to hear it, but I used to say that um, we need more nuclear power plant accidents. If only we'd had more nuclear accidents, we'd be way better off. Because it would be like flying, you know, every once in a while a plane crashes and everybody dies, but then you realize like, okay, that's, that's only one out of a lot of planes and the chances I'm going to die are very small. And it's, it's, you know, you learn to live with it. 
you do the best you can to keep planes from crashing and you keep flying. And I think we would have done that with nuclear, like, yeah, low level radiation gets released from time to time. And every once in a while, there's some big thing like Chernobyl goes completely wrong and uh, hundreds of people maybe die. But you power the whole world cleanly, you know, with this power source. So we didn't go that way. And we, we started to try to make it safer and safer and got this attitude that, you know, Three Mile Island was another one, 1979, that didn't harm anybody, but it just freaked everybody out. And then you start pouring all this money into making sure that another Three Mile Island never happens. Well, the rational thing would be like, I don't care if a Three Mile Island happens, but it was expensive. You know, it's like not a good thing to have happen, but, um, but you try to keep that from happening and, and, but you build your nuclear power plants. So instead we've built them um, more expensively. They have gotten somewhat larger um, because of the economies of scale. Uh, and the, I would say the best plant, the best reactor type in the world, in my book, <laughs> this might be fighting words, um, is the South Korean APR 1400. Um, it's an advanced pressurized reactor, South Korean, based on a Westinghouse design originally. And this is the one that they built in United Arab Emirates, four reactors in the plant. They built it on time, on budget. The three of them are on the grid, and the fourth one is just about to. I think it's gone critical and about to start sending electricity to the grid. Um, so, the, and the, if you look at nuclear in South Korea, it's the cheapest energy out there. They don't have a lot of good resources, um, but it's cheaper than coal, cheaper than hydro, cheaper than everything. Um, so that's a good model. And, and the plant is so small, like I love that environmentally, but 1.4 gigawatts is a big reactor. Um, yeah, so they have gotten bigger. The, uh, and it, you know, that's the best side of the the growth, the new generations. Of course, it's got all these safety features. I think it could probably be made cheaper if you would simplify some of it. Um, the other big ones, the European pressurized reactor, EPR, um, is also very big, one and a half gigawatts, and it has not had such a happy history they went over budget behind schedule and the first one has now opened Finland and it's good. You know, once it's like ours in Georgia, which is a Westinghouse AP 1000, um, 1 1.1 gigawatts. And once they open, once you get it there, then it's a lot of electricity, a lot of carbon free electricity, you know, that, that you get out of it. Finland, you know, you see their carbon emissions come down um when they do that but um but it, it just took way too long and the one in georgia was way too long and too expensive it's just a terrible model but that was the first of a kind i don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the ap1000 design and we yeah. could build more of that probably the fastest way to build nuclear reactors in the united states would be to build a bunch of ap1000s at existing nuclear sites that are already licensed and the reactor's already licensed and you could really build them pretty fast. Um, mm -hmm. As an example, it's illegal to build a nuclear in Massachusetts, my dear state, but New Hampshire right next door, it has a nuclear plant at Seabrook. Um, it's right over the border, right next to Boston. So that's you know generating for Boston, but it happens to be in New Hampshire where they like nuclear energy. And it was originally built it was designed for two reactors and they built the first one. And then there was this big wave. If you're, if you're old enough, like me, you remember my friends getting arrested in the protests, the big wave of protest against Seabrook, um, the clamshell Alliance, it was called, it was, these were fun days for the young activists like me. Huh. Um, but so it's been sitting there with one reactor and the second one never got built. So, what the heck, build a second reactor, send the energy to Boston, Massachusetts, maybe not doesn't want to build them, but there's a lot of sites like that where there's space to build more reactors 
that said, it's not going to solve climate change that way because these, you know, this it's a limited option. You get some mileage out of it. If you want to really go out and and knock fossil fuel off the grid, you have to do something more ambitious than that. Right. One other thing I want to talk about is carbon pricing. And this yeah. is I think a controversial topic. Uh, I know it's controversial in Ontario. We have our, our own kind of carbon tax system. Um, I'd love to so. Nuclear, the, the promise here of, of building out this bright future with nuclear is that the energy is now much cheaper. Um, is that enough to incentivize everyone to move away from carbon based sources? Or is a like is a carbon taxing or carbon price system necessary at all? If we have a bunch of nuclear that is cheaper than what we would have otherwise had with coal. Well, ideally, you would have a carbon price and it would make nuclear more competitive. It would be a big, big factor because when you think about it, the fossil fuels are just dumping their trash for free into the atmosphere. And you can't do that at the dump, you know, or your sewer or any place else. You pay a fee to get rid of your garbage. And they ought to do that. And if somebody isn't producing that garbage, they don't have to pay the fee and they they have an advantage out of that. If nuclear can can be cheaper without that, then that's that's the best thing because it's really hard to get carbon pricing politically. Um, yeah. It's like theory and practice don't match up here because in theory, all the economists will tell you carbon pricing is the most sensible way to deal with carbon pollution um, that's causing climate change. And um, in my mind, eventually what you, what you need is some kind of a global carbon price to put CO2 into the atmosphere. And it has to ultimately be equal to the cost of sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere, you know, capturing it back and putting it underground or somewhere. Um, and that's a whole technology that's not developed well yet and is still very expensive. So there's a big gap between what a reasonable carbon price might be that wouldn't grind your economy to a halt and what it actually costs to pull the carbon back out of the air. But in the long term, if, if you put it up there, you got to take it down or you have to probably sequester it before you put it up there because it's easier than after it's there. Um, this however, is something that I don't know much that, about. What's that? But this is something that I don't know much about, but I, I'd love to hear more about how carbon is priced today. Like, how do you actually ensure you're accurately pricing? You know, I have a farm and I have 12 cows. And, you know, how do you measure the carbon output of those 12 cows versus my the grass or the, the any kind of plant sequestering carbon? Or, you know, my cow has a baby. Now I've got 13 cows. How are people actually measuring carbon output today? I, I understand it for a factory in like a large industrial setting. Yeah. But everyone else, how, how do you measure that? Well, for cows is a different, and we'll talk about the methane from your cows too, um, which is another factor here. But but just on the energy side, um, the good thing about carbon pricing is you can price it at the source, or you know, like at the wellhead, or at the port of import if you're importing energy. So you don't have to go around and look at everybody who's burning oil and polluting the atmosphere with CO2, you can just tax the oil when it comes in and right. take it at that point. Um, the, and not get into the little details of it, but the trouble is that, well, number one, the, the real price that you would need to make a difference is probably too expensive to be practical because you'll, you'll drive the economy into a recession if you do it. By the way, also you can, the import tax is good because if some other country doesn't, ta let's say somebody produces a good and they don't use carbon pricing and then they try to import the good into Canada from wherever it's made, Bulgaria or China or whatever. Um, and then if they didn't apply the carbon price when they were making that good, you can apply it at the border when it comes into Canada. And then you get the money from that. And very quickly, Bulgaria will apply their own <laughs> pricing so that they can keep the money. So right. it's it's not that hard to do technically, but this is all on the theory side. And on the practice side, 
energy prices are very politically sensitive. And you see this all over the world where governments subsidize gasoline. If they try to take the subsidies off and the price of gas goes up, you literally have riots in the street within days. And governments fall over this. Uh, it's just really unpopular to price energy higher. And people don't think about, you know, well, but we're saving climate change this way or, or whatever. Um, they, in Australia, you might remember, so maybe five years ago, the, the government put in, maybe longer than that, government put in a carbon tax and the opposition, the conservative opposition ran in the next election running against that tax and they won the election and they took away the tax. You know, it's like, can't win right. an election on charging more for energy. The state of Washington and the United States put it on a referendum on the ballot and it failed. And so it's, there's a history of um, difficulty in getting carbon pricing through politically. Um, there's a group called Citizen Climate Lobby mentioned in the book uh, in the headquarters in the United States that what now has their plan is to charge a carbon price, but then take that money and give it back to the citizenry um, in a, a rebate carbon fee and rebate. And that's more politically popular. It's probably too complicated for most people to support politically because you know, you're paying more for gas, but then you're getting a check in the mail back. And the big problem with it is it doesn't pay to remove the carbon again. You know, like I said, you gotta sort of set the price at, in the long term at what it's gonna cost you to take it back out of the atmosphere. Right. Um, and then there's that other side, though, of the carbon market that it makes sense that you can price carbon, uh, you know, as as oil comes into a country, you can price it there. But you you also have the other side of it where if someone's got a big open field and they've got a bunch of plants on there that are that are taking in carbon, right. how, do you, how do you return money to them or how do you well, offset you, the expenses or the, the carbon they're putting into the atmosphere versus the stuff they're taking out? That I seems mean, to be a really hard yeah, problem. We should pay you with your farm to, you know, if you plant trees on the farm, we should pay you for them. And but how do you, you again, know, how, how do you verify that I've planted a hundred trees? Yeah. And how do you keep those, those costs from sort of eating up the whole benefit from it? I don't mm -hmm. know the answer. I live in a place in New England that's, it's called the North Woods from here up to the Canadian border. And I guess it doesn't stop at the border either. And it's just <laughs> like a vast, forest of trees um, and they're doing a lot of good work for the climate, but there's nobody quite has a way to account for it. There's also methods um, to cap the amount of carbon emissions. And then it's instead of just a price per gram of carbon, um, instead you set a limit of how much carbon and then you sort of have allowances that it can be traded back and forth to stay within that limit. The, the schemes all get a little bit complicated. Europe, probably the furthest along, they have a kind of continent-wide carbon price, but the prices fluctuate around a lot, you know, go up and down depending on circumstances. And that's not good because industries need, you know, reliability, stability of pricing. Um, yeah. They're going to plan long-term investments. They don't want to invest in something that's going to save carbon and then have the carbon price crash or vice right. versa. Um, it just so, doesn't make sense to me that this is a one-sided market, that if, if you're really trying to incentivize people to take in carbon from the atmosphere, why wouldn't there be a, uh, let's call it a rebate or like a, a reward for doing so? It seems like all the carbon taxing situations are all like an ad additional tax and there's never an opportunity for someone to get a lower tax or a lower price or we're going to actually pay you to get rid yeah. of this stuff. There is some of that going on with the, the sequestration schemes. There's some mm. subsidy for it in the United States, certainly. Um, I think the big picture is politically, it's really hard to raise taxes, especially on energy, 
Yes. And so that's kind of hit a wall. And it's much easier to give out subsidies. Mm -hmm. You know, people would rather you give them money than you tax them more. Right. Even though maybe it comes back around as inflation and people end up losing it anyway. Yeah. Um, but that's where the United States certainly has gone is these big subsidies that are increasing all the time. And the trouble with that, the reason the economists like the carbon price better is then you have to decide what you're going to subsidize. You're going to subsidize nuclear energy. Are you going to subsidize wind and solar? Or should they be equivalent somehow? And the subsidies can be pretty perverse in their effects to, for instance, there's a been a for years a production tax credit for wind in the United States. If you put up a wind farm and you produce wind energy, you get a tax credit of, I think it's been three cents a kilowatt hour um, to produce that energy. So then you put a, then the next people put in more wind and the next people until pretty soon you have too much wind on the grid. And when it's windy, the price of electricity goes to zero or negative. And they'll pay people to take energy off the grid because they're producing so much. And so then with the subsidy, that's okay for the wind producers because they're still getting this until it goes to negative three cents a kilowatt hour. After that, they're losing money. But, you know, within that range, they can pay a negative they can sell their electricity for a negative price and still make money on it because of the production credit. But the, huh. but the producers like nuclear that can't ramp up and down very quickly, um, you know, they, they have to get out of the way when that's happening, but they don't have anything else to do with the electricity that's coming off their reactor because the reactor is going 24-7. Um, so that's, that's been problem. You know, we've had some plants shut down over that kind of yeah. setup. And uh, so the subsidies tend to get complicated and pretty politicized and you favor one industry over another and so forth. The carbon price gets rid of all of that. It's like the level playing field. You, you make carbon, you pay, you take up carbon, you get paid, right? Yeah. And then you let the technology, also, you let the market forces sort it all out, which, which I like better. But as I say, very hard to do politically. Right. Okay, let's finish this conversation off with, we've talked about nuclear a lot today. What are some other technologies or emerging ideas that you think might also be able to help either in augmenting nuclear or maybe in, in, in the future, even replacing the need for nuclear? What are the other technologies that you're excited about when it comes to energy kind of transition? Well, before I dump nuclear too fast here, I, I want to say one thing about the, the way that nuclear direction is going, because there's a couple of things we haven't talked about. Um, one is making nuclear reactors that are specifically designed for an application, which which is not putting a lot of energy on the grid from a centralized power plant. You know, we have that. Uh, it's too expensive, but we have it. Um, but um, data centers are really important now, a uh, big source of growth in electricity use in, in those billion people, especially that we, that we think about so much, the industrialized world. Um, the data centers need um, 80 megawatts of electricity, and they need it around the clock, 24-7, and it really has to be reliable and it has to be affordable. So it's but the affordability is actually less important than the reliability and having that round the clock supply. So it makes me think, you know, somebody probably is already or should be soon um, developing. They're, they're talking about building data centers with the built in nuclear reactor so they have their own power supply. And somebody ought to be building like an 80 megawatt reactor specifically to run data centers. Um, district heating is another one. There's a, a group in Finland that's trying to develop nuclear reactors that won't produce electricity. They'll produce heat and they'll use it to heat buildings with. So if, you're, if your goal is like the district heating system, I don't know what, what you have in Toronto, but um, New York certainly has a lot of district heating and you, know, you can just put the nuclear reactor on that and produce heat. That's what, that's what nuclear does produce and you know, skip the electricity generation. And there's a lot of others like making hydrogen and um, uh, running um, 
Oh, we haven't talked about uh, commercial shipping, merchant shipping. You know, these big container ships, um, are, they operate off the dirtiest of the oil, like bottom of the barrel, bunker fuel, very polluting. And uh, we know from the, from the U.S. Navy um, that you can run ships off of nuclear reactors. Um, of course, those are expensive because it's the military, but there's a, an effort now to, to build reactors that are specifically to run container ships off of, um, and, and they'll go faster. So your goods will get to where they're going like a week sooner, and that's money in your pocket. And then when your ship gets to port and you're unloading it, you can plug into the grid and provide them with some electricity. So these are like cool applications that are beyond the, the big power plant putting electricity on the grid. And then um, there are the micro reactors that are like uh, as, as little as uh, less than one hundredth of the size of a traditional big, like the South Korean plant I'm talking about, um, you know, down to just a few megawatts, um, 10 or 20 megawatts maybe. And <clears throat> those have an application not on the grid, but behind the meter, meaning you can go, there's a company called Last Energy that I'm pretty excited about that's going to Poland first and some other places, UK, and selling companies on building these 20 megawatt little reactors on site for their factory. And the nice thing is then the company, the last energy is competing against retail electric prices. You're not competing against the wholesale price. You're not worrying about the wind coming and going on the grid and all that. You're like, we'll put this same with the data center. You know, we'll put it on site behind the, the meter and um, generate the electricity right there where it's needed or the heat if that's what you need. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And I was in Madrid a couple of years ago with the, with our a year and a half ago with our film, Nuclear Now, um, and showing it there, uh, hosted by Norman Foster, who's a pretty famous architect. He designed like the Apple headquarters in California and buildings like that, famous buildings that we know. And so touring around his, um, foundation there he's got models of all his skyscrapers that he's built and then in one of the rooms is a model of a micro reactor nuclear reactor and i'm like wait i know that i saw that at mit <laughs> and so his idea is to build skyscrapers with nuclear reactors powering them you know there's that's something small enough now the trouble with the small ones is they tend to be more expensive because you don't get the economies of scale um, but the good thing about them is they have the potential to really be built um, sequentially, bringing the cost down. You know, the way we build planes or even cars, you know, sort of crank them out from an assembly line. Um, there's a, a factory, a Sheffield Forge Masters, it's called, in, in the UK, that's a welding and sort of fabrication place that has just, in, in this week, in this last week, come out with the news that they have a new welding technique, high-tech thing, and they were able to do all the welds in a nuclear reactor vessel that normally takes a year to weld this thing to the high standards that are required to pass regulation, all that. Normally takes a year. They just did it in 24 hours with this new technology. So I mean, huh. this is like big, big changes. And with the smaller reactors to be able to crank them out that way, you know, 24 hours to make a nuclear reactor vessel is pretty good, right? Um, and to, to then sp spread them around in more places. Right. So, okay, so that's the nuclear. So, um, so we, we're moving in a lot of new different directions with it. Um, but would I like one in, in my small town here in Massachusetts? Yeah. You know, so, get off of the centralized grid more because with the, the renewables, originally the idea with, with solar was you'd have this dis distributed generation. You'd be making your own electricity on your roof. And this is what people do with the home batteries. It's just too expensive to be uh, you know, practical for most people. But 
but you know you you're making your own energy and you don't rely on the grid you don't need this expensive transmission infrastructure and all that stuff that was going to be the solar vision but with micro reactors that could be the nuclear vision you know huh. every town could have their reactor and it's just so much more resilient for the grid um and you know that in a storm they keep producing and you know under all kinds of conditions um so i like these micro reactors but they're they're still too expensive but i want yeah. to keep an eye on that um so the other other technologies that i you know like sometimes i say like what if people are just too scared of nuclear and they're always going to be and they just see the, the mushroom cloud and the bomb and it's not going to work you know like what if people are just that scared and I do have a saying that when nuclear produces at two cents a kilowatt hour, people will stop being scared of it. <laughs> it's <like laughs> flying, right? This is too convenient. And we'll forget we were afraid of it. But what if that doesn't happen and people just stay stay afraid? Then what do we do about climate change? And that's a that's a hard one. Um, but I think the deep geothermal is a good one to go with. Um the batteries you want to do everything you can with batteries because the wind and solar are, are cheap um it's sort of impractical as you get into more and more of them but you know solar plus a really cheap battery could be could go a long way um at least a certain amount of it fusion definitely should try to do that and hope that it works sooner than later and there are companies there's one in massachusetts commonwealth fusion that they think that they've got the secret sauce and they're going to make this thing work and faster than any of us expect and like in a decade they're going to be putting electricity on the grid and stuff yeah I kind of believe it when i see it but i sure hope it's true right <laughs> that would be good um if it's cheap and i'm not sure it ever will be but at least people aren't afraid of it i'm not quite right. sure why they're not afraid of fusion and they are afraid of fission but but that's how it is they they're they're not afraid and then uh, i mentioned in the book that the uh solar geoengineering the idea that we cut down the amount of sun hitting the planet and slow down climate change that way is kind of a hail mary thing because you don't really know quite what's going to happen but you have a pretty good idea because it's just mimicking what volcanoes do when they shoot a bunch of sulfur into the upper atmosphere and it does cool the the world for a few years a little bit and the trouble is you have to keep doing it or else the moment you stop everything catches up with you <laughs> you know you know that carbon all that um climate change right. but it's all being held at bay or slowed down by blocking some of the sun getting to the earth the, there's a little evidence that the recent in this past year there's been a big spike of warming in the world and nobody's quite sure why and there's some evidence that that has to do with changing ships off from the dirtiest bunker fuel to uh, make them cut down their sulfur emissions which is a good thing right because it's cutting down a pollutant but it also cuts down the sulfur it's like a little mini volcano on a ship that's putting that sulfur up into the atmosphere and blocking a little bit of sunlight when you suddenly pass a new regulation and stop that sulfur going up then more sunlight gets through and you get a spike of temperature that might be what's happening in the last huh. year um and uh that's interesting yeah it's just it it's uh it's a tricky thing because again politically like if this can be done quickly and it slows down the immediate and worst effects of climate change that is putting sulfur in the air it will be probably done with airplane little airplanes going up and and shooting sulfur particles around up there or something like that um it's cheap to do relatively cheap for the effect it has so you could have small countries just doing it on their own or even uh NGOs you know well, it won't be greenpeace but you know somebody <laughs> um just deciding to do that bangladesh 
you know, but then you got a bunch of sulfur in the air, right? And what are the downstream well, effects out, of that? It drops out of the air. The trouble is that it doesn't stay up there long term, and then you have to keep putting it up. It's like a little bit of a drug addiction sort of yeah. metaphor that you got to keep putting it up and more and more of it to keep up with um, the the damage that you're doing that you're masking with this. On the other hand, you know, masking the damage might be a good thing if things are really going out of control. That you have to, mm. you'd have to do it really slowly over like, you know, 50 years of ramping it up and 50 years of drawing it back down again after you got things under control. And then there's no mechanism internationally to do that. And you probably don't want Bangladesh deciding that climate change is hitting them pretty hard and they're going to just use their resources to, to do it. And then maybe some other country goes and knocks the sulfur out again. It's difficult. And also, um, ocean acidification is a big issue, and this does nothing to help that. So if you're putting up a lot of CO2, the oceans are really important. So this goes to your question of, you know, what else do I find promising? And there is there are some things with the ocean. There are plans to, um, instead of trees, to use kelp. Um, you go out into the ocean, and it's pretty easy to stimulate the growth of kelp, which is deacidifying the ocean. Um, as the carbon goes into the kelp from the ocean, then the ocean will suck more carbon out of the air to replace it. So it's it's a little bit long term, but you are decarbonizing the atmosphere, actually solving the problem. Then you sink the kelp to the bottom of the ocean, um, where it'll sequester for long term. Right. And that's great, and, you know, if you can make the the scale work. And then I even heard a plan, I don't know if anybody's really working on this, but to, to take kelp or corn stalks and use nuclear power to basically turn them into feedstock for existing refineries, oil refineries. And oil refiners themselves use a lot of energy and then processing this into something that looks like crude oil to the refinery would use a lot of energy. But if you can use nuclear for that, and then you've got a renewable, actual renewable resource, the, the biomass that you're growing, and then turn, turn that kelp into crude oil, into crude oil and then into all the refined products. And if you can do that at scale, um, in other words, in, instead of sinking the kelp to the bottom of the ocean, you turn it into oil and you run all your transportation fleet on it. Um, transportation is a big one. Electricity is the, the lesser problem for right. carbon emissions and climate change. So transportation is big and building heat industry. Those are all big ones. But this idea of, of uh, a substitute fuel is very appealing because instead of having everybody change the equipment they're using, um, like let's say you're burning heating oil to heat your house. And so currently the plan is, well, you know, you're going to have to stop burning heating oil and put in an electric heat pump. And then we're going to need to switch over the electricity, not in Ontario where it's already, already low carbon, but, you know, in places that aren't, we got to you know, get the coal off and make clean electricity and then switch over all the equipment and switch off our all our gas powered cars for electric cars, et cetera. But if you can go back to the source and create something that looks like diesel to your truck, but came from kelp instead of coming from being pumped up from underground, you know, and therefore the, you're capturing the sunlight that powered the kelp growing, um, that's much faster and much easier and much politically easier um, to, to create substitute fuels. Right. I think bacteria may have a role in this too. They're a great little factory. If you can have a have a bacteria, nuclear powered bacteria. No, I just made that up. Um, <laughs> but Josh, no, well, this has been a serious chemical. So th th those are the thing. Those are the ones I find most interesting, most promising. But none of yeah. them quite as clean cut and fast as nuclear power. This has been an enlightening conversation. We covered a lot of ground here. Uh, I'm sure listeners are going to enjoy it. Where can they go to learn more about you and your work? Well, I'm at joshuagoldstein.com with an E-I-N. Um, and there's a website about the book 
called uh, Bright Future Book, not a Bright Future Book, but called brightfuturebook.com. And that's got the info about the book. And then the film, which is really the, I think the, the ultimate way in to my thinking on the topic, uh, Nuclear Now film is available on Amazon or Apple TV for rent for a few dollars. Uh, there's a DVD out if anybody still has a DVD player. Um, and uh, that, and then there's a website, I think, called nuclearnowfilm.com um, that has more information about that. And awesome. anybody can write to me through the website. My email address is on there on joshuagoldstein.com. Perfect. Thank Great. you so much for taking the time today. And thank you so much for writing this book. Yeah. Thanks for the conversation. Keep up the good work.